the allure of venture capital funding, it seems that it's going like a, a lot of more people are not going that route. Not to say that it isn't right or wrong. Like I, I you know, there's startups that do really well when they're VC backed. However, I think you have to think as the entrepreneur, what's like, why did you get yourself into this? You know, on top of like building something that is completely innovative and, um, you know, it's your idea that you're building from the ground up. Like, do you want to be all, like managed by other VCs? Do you want to be managed by other investors that are more active? Do you want to um, give up equity, like a lot significant amount of equity? Like you have to think about those things. And like, if you're okay with those things, like, yeah, maybe that's the path to go. But I think it really just depends on... All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another fabulous episode of the Healthcare Trailblazers podcast. Excited to be sitting here uh, today with Dana Lay, LinkedIn top voice, um, TEDx speaker, fantastic entrepreneur, Forbes 30 under 30, building something really interesting and very international. So Dana, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. So let's do a quick trip down memory lane. Where'd you grow up and how did you get involved in healthcare? Yeah. So I grew up in Texas um, and I always wanted to be in a service focused industry. I wanted to make an impact. I uh, knew that as I was in, well, I was a patient uh, pretty like pretty often for some random reasons uh, throughout uh, college and, you know, throughout life. And I figured that, you know, the, the system kind of sucks. And I uh, I knew that I didn't want to go towards the clinical path. I wanted to do something on the administrative side because I figured that that's where the change happens. So I decided to go down that journey and um, went to grad school. Um, I went to Columbia University in New York City, moved to the Big Apple, uh, which was really cold coming from Texas, um, but it was it was a good change. And then... Um, went into consulting and uh, built some accelerators. And now I'm here as a startup founder. Awesome. So first thing that strikes me about your story, most young people don't even register that there is a healthcare system, much less care to change it. So yeah. uh, unless, you know, so what, what, what was that interaction? Why did you, what, what, why did that become a passion of yours? Yeah. Um, so in college, every semester I was either admitted to the ER or had some type of like health condition that I had to, I had to constantly be managing. So I interacted with the healthcare system pretty often and I, in, in different, um, outlets, different settings, inpatient, outpatient, all these things. And it all sucked. Like it didn't, it didn't feel great. I didn't feel great already. And, um, to, for me, I knew that I wanted to do something to support people, help people, you know, create a lasting impact here uh, for society. And and in the beginning, I really thought, okay, well, I, I maybe the only thing I know is just kind of like the business side of things. And now kind of coupling the two, the business side of healthcare. And I thought, oh, I'll just be a, a hospital administrator because that's all I knew. But the the more, you know, it's like one of those things where you don't necessarily know what you know. And um, when I got into it a little bit more, I uh, started learning more about innovation, started to learn how there's different health systems that were interested in trialing new things, uh, whether that be uh, a new digital therapeutic, a digital health solution. Even on the tech side, there's also like a lot of the back end stuff. But back then, people were just talking about health IT, which is completely different from what you consider uh, digital health or health tech is now. Um, and so I think that that's kind of like, that didn't necessarily attract, like that wasn't as attractive <laughs> to me, but um, as I continued to go into like the path of, okay, I'm going to start um, thinking about how I can build new initiatives out. So went back that like my first job was I co-founded a, leadership apprentice program at the local medical school that had just opened up um, two or three years old years into it and i was like well there's not a lot of resources for people who are 
in the like healthcare and business side of things, let's let's do something about it. So got a bunch of faculty members um, and staff to volunteer to be like mentors and like uh, provide pretty much an apprenticeship to, for uh, university students uh, around the Austin community, like Austin community area and to make an impact in the health there. So I, I didn't want to just me myself to make the only the only impact, but I wanted like a community impact. I wanted others to also learn and build and grow um, an ecosystem. That's awesome. And um, so you mentioned that you did a couple accelerators. What what kind of accelerators? What was that? Yeah. Um, so my so pretty much like my first my first I guess like taste of what the startup round would even look like and what it was all about was that I built this consortium of international hospitals. We had over 60 hospitals in that network. And they were interested in innovation. They were interested in putting money towards innovation, but they had certain wish list items, like how do you transition from uh, pediatric to adult care? They were interested in mental health solutions. They were interested in um, maybe thinking about care coordination. So understanding what their problems were, um, I was able to think about how we can source different types of startups through our accelerator programs. And that one, so, you know, started an accelerator program focused on pediatric innovation and we did so well. We had, um, I think the first cohort was 13 companies and we got about 20, 23 pilots out of it which was great. Yeah. And so then, yeah, yeah, it's incredible because we were able to, we knew the decision makers, we knew the, the purchasers, we knew the sales cycle really well, trained it to the startups, trained the hospitals to understand how to work with startups and sped that process up along. And then we got, you know, we became very newsworthy and um, Amazon Web Services heard about us, Breast Ganey, Elevance Health, a lot of different corporates that were willing to partner with us, work with us, pay us money to actually run their programs too. That's so cool. You brought efficiency to innovation. That's incredible. Yeah, I, we're trying. <laughs> That's incredible. Are you still doing that? Is that an active thing? No. So that was, that was my last venture before. Okay. Now I'm like full time on my startup. Yep. All right. So let's, let's jump into Wander Health. Uh, what is Wander Health? Yeah. So Wander Health manages and um, vets international networks of English speaking doctors. And we focus on primary care and urgent care at the moment. Um, and what, how, what we do with that network is that we connect American travelers going abroad to these English speaking doctors that are local to that particular area. Um, they provide in-person and um, home visits. And so what it, who it helps is, it's generally the people who might be thinking about their health more often um, maybe it's the travelers that travel to multiple loca multiple countries or different locations um, pretty often throughout the year or somebody who may be just in, in a particular international city for a long extended period of time. But they, so the reason for that is that a lot of people think, oh, I have travel medical insurance. I should be okay. Yeah, you have coverage. Um, you don't, if you read the, the fine print, sometimes it's not completely covered. Um, but once you look into it a little bit more, you realize, oh, it's only for emergencies and it's based off of what the insurance company decides if it's like, actually uh, they'll reimburse it or not. And then on top of that, what we solve is actually finding you the vetted doctor that is reputable, that is, um, uh, credentialed and licensed, that is, um, people that we would trust to even send our own family members to that can actually take care of you instead of you having to spend hours figuring it out, how the healthcare system works, who to go to, what to do. So we're that, think of us as that find a provider network, or um, I'd like to say, call us the international uh, one medical uh, without the brick and mortar. So, yeah. Yeah. It's such a genius pain point because I, you know, and I hopefully will never have to find out, but I can only imagine that the most terrifying thing uh, would be to be in, in a foreign country where you're traveling and God forbid, you know, end up in a medical situation. And then who is this doctor? Like, 
okay, so just just go to the hospital. Well, this, I only have one body, and I don't know who this who this yeah. person is. I don't know if they're gonna if I'm gonna end up with only one kidney. Like I don't, I'm gonna you know I don't know what's going on. And so um, it's 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 almost like it's I think some of the smartest things are the ones where you think like wow how was this not there before. And so um, I think you have one of those ideas, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, we're in the 21st century. I'm actually very surprised that we don't necessarily have a, an extensive network that can support us when we are traveling abroad, even though travel, the yeah, travel industry is constantly growing, one of the largest service industries and healthcare, we all need healthcare. Um, that's and that's, that's a big reason why a lot of people don't travel sometimes too, because they're worried about their health. Yeah, that's wild. Um, wow. So where are you at in, 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 in the journey? What areas do you cover? What does the network look like currently? Yeah, we currently have over 450 English speaking doctors around the world, um, spread across at right now, um, nine countries, but we're continuing to grow. Um, and we're continuing to build it out. We are mostly in Europe and central and South America at the moment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think like we're trying to get and learn more about our travelers, where everyone's going, um, especially the ones that are more that that travel frequently. Yeah, super random. But do you have anything in Brazil? Uh, we're about to oh, yeah? uh, add a, a location in Brazil. Yes. Why is that the case? I have some travel plans there, like down oh, good. on the Amazon River over there. So might oh, be a little fun. remote, but um. That's really cool. So, and, and so, so what's the, um, like, I can see this, I can see you partnering with, um, with the actual travel insurances. I mean, travel insurance is really interesting because they've somehow gotten themselves really deeply embedded into, uh, travel booking, which is really interesting. Like, yeah. like they have somehow incentivized the travel booking agencies to literally force you to buy it. It's like, are you sure you don't want this insurance? You know, you could die. And then no one, <laughs> you know, like they're like so it's aggressive about it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so is that, what's kind of like, what's your go-to-market strategy uh, besides for just like marketing right to people? I mean, the messaging makes a lot of sense, but. Yeah, we actually, that's more of like our, um, our, our focus is towards like businesses. So we are looking at insurance companies and travel agencies as both distributors. Um, you're completely right. Like insurance companies, they generally don't, want to build a whole network of doctors and have to manage it and have to keep relationships with uh, with them. It's generally something that they either outsource or they um, think about, like they they don't even have the resource itself. Um, so yeah, we were looking at those two kind of uh, avenues at the moment. It's so interesting. Like I, I, I really, I can't believe that, I can't believe that this wasn't like an elementary, like you said, that there wasn't a global network. And so, um, yeah. So found, so this is your first startup from the ground up. I mean, you did the accelerator, but this, so how's, how's that going? How are you feeling? How are the ups and downs? Yeah. So my, all the accelerators that I had built, I was an entrepreneur. Um, like I was like part of the founding team, you know, built all that, but you know, I had backing from a large, uh, institution, but then this time it's my first time being an entrepreneur and yeah, it is way different than, anybody whatever anyone says like people say it's hard but it's actually way harder than that um it, like i think that the, yes like there's days where you try to plan out your day on what you need to get done and what you need to work on and all that stuff but it varies and changes like depending on like what pops up things change really quickly um you also have to know what your focus is i think like in the beginning when i started I, like every other startup founder too, um, just got, there was a lot of noise and it was hard to figure out which person, which uh, advice I should take. And I was thinking, oh, like go to like all the networking events, like I'll meet somebody that might help me, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, then I started to realize, wait, like I need to, I need to just focus on working. I need to focus on doing this and not to say the networking events aren't great and all i think that it helps if you have like a better like um in, like have a more um a goal or an intention on why you're going to this particular event because time your time is valuable as a founder and i've learned that uh i i, I learned that along the way 
Yeah, that's a, it's a great point you bring up. And I've, I've said something very similar in the past where something that you start learning about yourself and then you start watching in other people is, is that one of the signs of kind of an immature, not in a bad way, but just like an immature or not yet mature entrepreneur um, or startup founder is where when you start a business, you're really excited about it. And when you're yeah. excited about you it, you want to do everything. Kind of, what's that? <laughs> you want to do everything, but you want to do everything. But you also it. you have like this lens on where you see your business in everything, and you see potential in every conversation, and you see yeah. a connection in every single person. Yeah, and yeah. it's so funny because you start like shoehorning these. To you, it doesn't sound like you're shoehorning it, but like you'll be talking to like you know a, a construction worker. And, you know, and you have, and you're like selling coffee and you'll be like, oh my goodness, I'm sure these guys drink a ton of coffee. Like, you know, like you'll be doing like these random like connections. And uh, to, to your point, I think as you mature and as you under, as you mature, you understand your business a lot better. And I think one of the signs of maturity is when you start really understanding who not to talk to, not from like a negative perspective, just like this isn't valuable. You know what I mean? Like at the, at the doing, moment, yeah, exactly at the moment or like this isn't like a really, really, you know, low hanging fruit kind of fit. It's not an obvious fit. You know what I mean? Is there, is there something to do with someone all the time? Yeah. But this isn't super obvious. And I think that that's, that's a really interesting um, um, metric to use to let that like, maybe you're getting somewhere with your business, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think it's the entrepreneurial mindset too, that you can make anything happen um, with anybody. And so I think that when you go into it, exactly, I, I feel the exact same way people think that it, your business will fit for any type of person, anything, anywhere you go. But in the beginning, you have to be a little bit more laser focused. You have to like, think about like, where, where's the, like, I need this now or yesterday um, feeling um, from yeah. like that particular market that you're going after. So yeah, I completely yeah. get that. So kind of on that topic, um, a lot of entrepreneurs and startup founders suffer from being overly ambitious and setting goals that they don't necessarily reach. Um, what are some thoughts that you have around that? Or how has your been experience? How has your experience been with kind of setting goals and actually reaching them or realizing you're way off target? How have you calibrated? Yeah. Um, so I, I am a very ambitious person as well. Mm -hmm. I set goals. Um, but I think I, try to be somewhat realistic with that based off of just like understanding, you know, like my team's capacity, um, understanding like our historical like performance, understanding like our financial uh, like runway that we have, like thinking about those components and kind of like putting all that together and making sense of it. Um, I think ambitious goals are great. However, like you don't want to let people down. Um, especially like investors or advisors or whoever's kind of like holding on and waiting on to it. Like you want to be like somebody people can trust. So if you're saying you're going to hit a certain goal, like I always try to think, okay, maybe I I'll set an ambitious goal. Um, and that could be something that is like internally, that's what we're going to go after. But externally, we're going to say something below that just so then we know that like, here's the realistic thing that still sounds pretty awesome. Um, but if we can beat it, that, that would be, that's kind of the standard. Um, so it, it, I think it just, it really depends on, um, it really just it kind of depends on a lot of different factors, but I, um, I, I like ambitious goals. I, I really do. Uh, but there's realistic goals too, that, um, probably makes more sense to communicate to externally. So you don't let people yeah. down. Yeah. So an another conversation that you and I had off, off, offline was, um, there's, there's two sides to the, to the funding conversation. There's, uh, people that are blinded by the game of like, you must let, like, you're not successful if you didn't find a cool VC that's going to, you know, and a fund that's going to, that's going to give you a bunch of money. And then, and like, that becomes the whole game. It's just like these, these vain metrics of like, who, who, you know, who managed the round and who, and how much did I, did I raise and how many employees do I have and how many, um, how many three letter, you know, uh, positions do I have at the company? Um, and then the flip side of that is like, nope, I'm going to build this myself. I'm going to chop down the trees and dry it myself and shape them and sand them and do everything from A to Z and not get any help from anybody. Um, 
what's your framework around the funding conversation? What, you know, when is it a good idea to, to maybe look at funding? What is it not a good idea? Yeah. So it seems like the industry changes a lot in terms of like at what stand, what's considered pre-seed and seed and series A and like certain things that you need to hit before you go and ask for funding if you want to go that route. So originally for myself, I bitched up for the first year. Um, I felt that I wanted to have heavy conviction on what I was doing, what I was building, who I was helping. And those like, it's a hundred percent guaranteed that things are going to change. Um, like when you first start out your business. And, um, I think that like, of course, like the mission and your, uh, who you want the, the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, should remain the same. And there are, you know, companies that they find, they get funding lots of like millions of dollars without anything but an idea or not even a pitch deck. Great. Good for them. But there's, there's a lot of pros and cons going that route if you're trying to, if you, if you got money from um, venture capital. VCs expect more. If you're raising more money, you're going, there's going to be higher expectations. Um, and then, you know, there's the path of, for me, like right now, I'm really focused on like angels and like, um, like private investors and thinking about like how I can support them and create a relationship with them and Make sure that like, you know, some, some investors want to be silent investors. That's fine. There's some investors that are, who are more um, active because they have the expertise um, that can support like our business as well. So I didn't even start truly taking checks until I felt confident that this was going to be a business that will succeed. And that was a year in for me. Some people are different. They, they, um, I know like I was fortunate enough that I had savings uh, from like my previous roles that I can continue to bootstrap. Um, but, you know, I think that, I think the allure of venture capital funding, it seems that it's going like a, a lot of more people are not going that route. Um, and not to say that it isn't right or wrong. Like I, I, you know, there's startups that do really well when they're VC backed. However, I think you have to think as the entrepreneur what's like why did you get yourself into this you know on top of like building something that is completely innovative and um you know it's your idea that you're building from the ground up like do you want to be all, like managed by other vcs do you want to be managed by other investors that are more active do you want to um give up equity like a lot significant amount of equity like you have to think about those things and like if you're okay with those things like yeah maybe that's the path to go but I think it really just depends on each entrepreneur and like what their goals are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think for those that it's just a game, it's pretty obvious. Like it's, I've come across a couple of these people where um, it's just surprising to me where I, I, I like the framework that you gave where every business is going to be different and the nature of certain businesses require funding or not. Like there's some businesses that you just cannot even start without money. And there's other yeah, like CPG, that's probably going to be hard, right? Like if you're building a, like a physical good, that's yeah. going to be hard. Medical devices, hard. Yeah. It's going to so. be money, right? Um, but then like there's, but, but I think, uh, yeah, and I think that the, the the like the fringe end of the extremist is kind of obvious. Like you speak to some people where it's just like, it's just a game. <laughs> like it's just a pitch deck. It's all like pie in the sky stuff, and you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. and it's all just about like getting to the next round. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what does 2024 look like for Wander Health? What is, uh, what are some of your, what are some of your goals? Yeah. So right now, as I mentioned, we're in nine countries. We're planning to expand to 20 in the next few months. Um, and hopefully more by the end of the year. Um, and we're really focused on really narrowing down like who we're selling to and, um, you know, closing those contracts and making sure that they're all happy and, whatnot. And then um, I think like for us, we're thinking, so we've been tech enabled and we're thinking about how we can uh, build our like tech on top of this, um, like actually start building a, a more, um, uh, what's the word, like and, 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 like a platform that like we've built ourselves. So we're thinking about those things too. Um, but at the moment, our 
our bread and butter is really our provider network that instantly you can just be booking real time um like the appointments on our platform without having to ever pick up a phone um and also we offer like same and next day um appointments for most of the clinics that we work with so we want to make sure that customer service is like the biggest thing and the um, experience is what we care about too for the the travelers that are using it yeah and then is there like a telehealth component to it as well if it's something that could be done over that or is it all in office not at the moment um a lot of our doctors do offer telehealth but at the moment we really want to differentiate ourselves by providing in-person uh care so i think that like there's opportunity down the line but at the moment no very cool wow well, um, I wish, first of all, congratulations. I think it's a, it's, it's a wonderful idea. Sounds like you're making really, really good headway on it. And, um, it's great to, uh, it's great. It's great to talk to you. I wish you tr- tremendous continued success through 2024 and beyond. And, um, this was a lot of fun. It'll be good to check in in a couple months. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on the, the, sh- the show, the, the episode there. I really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, excited to also follow your journey too. Thank you.